So uh, um, anyway, all right, take your Bible again, if you would, please. I want you to come to Job chapter number 23. For those of you that weren't in Sunday school, we'll continue this thing about the fear of the Lord and the importance of it. Now, I heard Brother Sam while I was going through, the acoustics in here are real different uh, than over there. And so I only caught bits and pieces of what he was saying, but uh, I'm noticing people are paying uh, 52 pickup or shift in places and do the best you can. And then once we get the pews in here, you'll have to kind of reshuffle again. Um, but uh, the, the way things are right now, you find yourself comfortable, but be prepared too. But you had a, a number of visitors that were here today. You had a a pretty good number of people that were here today, and and uh, and so as that happens, and people find out they can come and spread out a little bit, uh, you're going to start seeing people that have come once or twice, and then they don't come back because they were packed like sardines over there. And uh, Brother Woodard, I'm putting you on the spot here. I don't mean to do it publicly, but I think if it's okay with you and not going to create a problem, even if the pews come in, I think we'll just stay here for now and uh, work out what we need to work out with Brother Dale and Miss Christie about getting things done. Maybe grabbing a few people after church today to just do a cursory cleanup. Uh, if we could, maybe you could help us do that. Just kind of wipe things down a little bit and kind of clean it up. That way they're not overwhelmed. Y'all have done a great job with the building, but I think I just want to... I think I just want to stay here, uh, even for the Wednesday evening service. And uh, I kind of, it's like we, we grabbed the pea patch and now I don't want to give it up. <laughs> I want to get used to it. And, uh, and so I thought I had a pretty good feel to it this morning, just home folks. So uh, I'd like to do that if that's not going to. And, uh, and then I'll hold it to you if you get a call and that they're on the way and we need to do something, then we'll call as many as we need to call to come move chairs out of your way so you can get that done. Does that work? Is that okay? All right, again, I'm not trying to put you in a bad spot. I know I shouldn't do that publicly before I ask you, but... All right, take your Bible and turn to the book of Job. Now, I've had a good day today, and uh, my daughter and son-in-law were here, and my grandson was here, and that's a, a blessing, and uh, able to have... Uh, made, made a little headway today, and that's a blessing. Um, and maybe, uh, hopefully, that some of your family came today, and they uh, saw something here, and maybe it draw them closer to the Lord, and I sure hope so. Job 23, where we were this morning, Job's going to say something that's pretty uh, profound. And in this passage right here, he gives you an idea that uh, people don't have enough of this. And that is that he's afraid of the Lord. Job says this in verse 15, Therefore am I troubled at his presence, when I consider I am afraid of him. Afraid of who? Afraid of the Lord. That's smart. That's wisdom. That's a great thing to be able to do is to say, I'm afraid of the Lord. Brother Gentry, amen. Afraid. Thank you. You can have a seat. Look, if you will, please, in the book of Proverbs, chapter number one. Now, I hit a couple of these, but I don't know how many of you were here when I went over it. And it's important that you get the biblical precedent uh, when it comes to these matters. It's important for you to understand uh, the context of what we're talking about. Uh, the modern theology is, is that God's just a God of love and that God just kind of looks the other way and winks at individuals uh, the mistaken idea is that people take the idea of the grace of God for granted. The United States of America for years, I won't speak about other country, has been doing things that are a slap in the face of God. And just because God doesn't respond to that or retaliate to that doesn't mean that He's letting it go. Uh, my God is right and my God is right and my God is right and all the time, the old black folks used to sing. That means God's keeping an account or a record of everything going on. And when the time comes, the Lord's going to say, okay, the cup of the Gentiles is now full, and then He's going to pour out His wrath and His indignation. Now, hopefully, Lord willing, although there's nothing in the Bible that says it, hopefully, Lord willing, the rapture will happen before it gets real bad. But the rapture didn't happen before it got real bad in other countries. Uh, when you had uh, the nation of England go against uh, Germany and they started doing things over there and then they turned against the Jews, uh, the Germans were allowed to go over there and make that from a first-rate world power to about a fifth or sixth-rate world power. And they were also bombed and firebombed and all those other kind of things. Now, people say you make too much out of it. God's into nations and in punishing sin. And what happened there is, is they turned against God's people and what they chose to do was to give up some land. And when they gave up that land and decided that they were going to take God's land away from him, God took that personal because that land grant, as I showed you, is in Genesis 15 when he's asleep. And so that's a permanent land grant that's given without conditions to it. 
And there's another place over there that he talks about in the book of Exodus. If you do this and you do this and you do this, I will do that. But that's not the Genesis 15 plan. The Genesis 15 plan or land grant that's there is given unequivocally and that's God's land. And the first time that they did that, they should have learned their lesson because Winnie the Pooh signed that thing and made the cocky statement of, you know, with one stroke of the pen, I've divided the land and created a nation, was what he said, calling it Palestine or the Palestinians. Well, right after that, they got blown off the map. Nobody paid any attention to that at all. Uh, the sun used to not set on Britain, but now it does. Britannica used to rule the waves. They don't anymore. Why? They mess with God's land grant and God's people. Now, not too uh, awful long after that, you had some issues that took place. And because your nation was involved in knowing what was happening by Hitler and also by Stalin, uh, again, involving God's people, the only saving grace you had in World War I and World War II, the only saving grace you had, come on in, sis, the only saving grace that you had was the fact that you were liberating His people or you'd have lost that war like you lost the other wars. But you were liberating His people. You weren't liberating uh, uh, people or ideas or thoughts. You were liberating Jewish people. And so when you decided to do that, then God saw fit to allow you to win the war. Here's where you made the mistake. Right behind that, you turn around and again, Britain steps in and says, well, we're going to go ahead and create a nation and we're going to allow this to take place and let the Jewish people return to their land. And when they went to go to return to their land, other lands wouldn't take them on. They were trying to pay people to take their the Jews that came out of their land. And when they got back to their land, they put them in concentration camps in Tel Aviv on the beaches. Now you say, preacher, why is that bad? Because uh, God's a God to be feared, especially when you're messing with his, with his people. Let me ask you a question. If you had children and somebody was constantly messing with your children... I mean, granted, I know they do wrong and get in trouble. I get, I understand that. I'm not talking about that. But if somebody was messing with your kids on a regular basis, you don't think you would say something about it? After a while, you don't think you'd have enough and they'd do everything you could within your power to put a stop to it? Well, sure you would. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? All right, why do you think God would be any different about His chosen people? You come down through there a little uh, or a, a short period of time, and uh, back in the days of Clinton, I mentioned this to you in Sunday school, Clinton comes over there and decides that they need to give a bunch of the uh, land. They take all the Israelites, all the Jewish people that are in that land of Canaan, the pa what they call Palestine, the West Bank now, and they demolished their houses and kicked them out and gave that land to the Palestinians and made the Jews go back across the creek over there, back across the, the sea over there, and go back into the nation of Israel and gave up their land. And in a short period of time, you had one of the worst hurricanes that ever ha hit called Katrina, and it came in and blew right in there off of uh, in New Orleans and did I don't know how many billions of dollars worth of damage that was in there. And people looked at that and thought, well, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, you know, how can you relate the two? Really, you can't miss the timing of that. The timing is incredible. Well, then you get somebody that's who's, uh, somebody's yanking his string and he's up there and he decides that when it comes time to whether he's going to stand with Israel or not, whether they were going to lose the vote or not, whether it was going to be popular or not, all he had to do was is to stand up and say, well, we're still standing with Israel. He would have still gotten defeated. You say, well, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Sometimes it's right to stand up. Even if you lose, it's still right to go down losing. And you know what he did? Uh, so he didn't upset anybody. He abstained. He just chose not to, to do that. And then all of a sudden they're starting to put, push, pre, put pressure on them to say you need to have a ceasefire agreement and this and that and the other. They tell me the timing. I don't know if it's exactly 12 hours or not, but they say within 12 hours you have a ship that runs over there and runs into the bridge and it has to be called Francis Scott Key Bridge. Why are you repeating this? Because it didn't make it out over the internet. The thing went kablooey the other day and it didn't go out. People need to hear what I'm talking about. You say, well, you don't think that was a terrorist, you don't think that was Hamas, or you don't think that was... I don't know what it was. I think God might have stirred up the GPS of that thing, and they tried to throw it in reverse, and they tried to do this and do that, just like with the Titanic. Why even God can't sink this ship? Okay, well, there's your, uh, you, you, you left your rope behind, and you left your binoculars behind, and you left your flares behind, and now there's an iceberg there in front of you. You should have weighed anchor a long time ago, but don't worry about it. God can't sink this ship. And an iceberg comes along and rips a gash down there. And I don't know, 15, 1,800 people wind up dying. Why? Because you, God's a God to be feared. Amen. 
when God gets to a point where He's had it with a nation, nations mean nothing to Him. I gave you the verses on Wednesday night. And I showed you that when God says to you, I considered all the nations, and all the nations were less than nothing. I mean, they were nothing. They were zero. They were a drop in a bucket. And then he pauses a minute and he says, no, they're less than nothing. That's an entire nation. Less than nothing. That's not a God to be feared. You have a God that's out there that has created things far and beyond the Milky Way. Uh, just because He created a little old marble called Earth down here, you think that's the end of all the galaxies that are out there? I didn't say there's people on other planets. I didn't say all that foolishness. What I said is, is there's galaxies and galaxies, billions of light years out there that go on beyond anything you can possibly imagine, and He wears that like a garment. That's how big your God is. And so I think God would take it a small thing for him to look down there and to see a ship right there and say, well, you know what's interesting? They broke their bridge with me between uh, America, United States, and, uh, and Israel. And how about if I just break the bridge for them and I break that bridge coming from that port to the other side? Those people now have to go through tunnels and stuff. He closed up a military port. Oh, preacher, that's just a coincidence. You go ahead and believe it's a coincidence. I don't believe anybody mashes a button. I don't believe anybody flings a nuke or whatever it may be. I don't think the war in Ukraine or anything else. I don't think any of that is just happenstance. I think there's a God behind the whole bit. And when God gets tired of fooling with a nation, He brings in another nation to hit that nation. And then when He's done with that, He'll hit the hitter. That's all through your Old Testament. All through your Old Testament, it's war and cutting and killing and beating and, and destroying nations. You say, why? Because they continue to reject God. Your nation for over 2,000 years now and the entire world, you've gone all the way around the whole thing. Your nation has rejected God, rejected God, rejected God, rejected God's Son, rejected God's Son, rejected God's Son. And sooner or later, he says, you know what? That's enough. You don't want me, no problem. But I'm done. And when he says done, you know what that is? That's something to be afraid of. Uh, if an individual in the day and time in which you're living, man, I think that the thing is so close you can feel his breath coming down your neck right now that the Lord could come, and if not by the rapture, by calamity. You're, if you study it just a little bit, you don't have to be a military expert. If you knew how close we are to all-out chaos and war, you'd be shaking in your boots. You'd be thinking to yourself, man, you got to be kidding me. I better start putting up some pork and beans and some uh, sardines or something, man. I mean, this thing could go south. But life just goes on. Everybody just blinks like, oh, well, they've been saying that and so on and so forth. Okay. I'm telling you right now, you are living in a time before I finish this sermon up tonight, you're living in a time where the life as you know it could completely change. All the plans you're making for college, all the plans you're making for getting married, having kids, all the stuff that you're planning on doing for your business or your house or, or whatever it might be, good plans, bad plans, vacation plans, uh, whatever it is that you're trying to do with all that. I'm telling you, you're on the verge where every plan you got just like that can be changed. And preacher, you know, I don't really believe that. Well, you don't study much. You say, what are you looking at? I'm looking at the temperature of the church. I'm looking at the temperature of the individuals and places where I go preach. There's this benign sort of a, sort of a who cares? It's, it's a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It starts with an A. Apathy. Apathetic. There's this apathetic approach toward it. It's like, yeah, whatever. I just don't really care. I don't know what it takes to light a, a fire under Christians nowadays. I'm not trying to just fire you up other than to scare you and to tell you, you better get your accounts in order or you say, why? I think the Lord's fixing to call it in. I think the Lord is getting ready to say, I've had enough. And no nation that continues to be here. Look, we got 4th of July coming up. No, no, what's next? Oh, boy, we got to, I missed something there. Mother's Day's first, right? And then after Mother's Day, you get Memorial Day, is that right? And then is it Father's Day? And then is it 4th of July? Independence Day. Well, I appreciate my independence, but what is it about that independence that makes you think that it's godly? Thirteen stripes? What makes you think that when you broke away from from England that it made it godly for you to break away. Why didn't you think God might not have wanted you to be under there? I mean, the Bible eventually comes from over there anyway. I mean, it came from over there anyway, didn't it? 
You think your nation's better off because it's not under that? Well, you're contrary to the Bible. Now you have to live with that. People don't like to hear that. Oh, I get it. Your rebellion is acceptable. That's not godly rebellion. That's your rebellion saying, well, it's okay for us to do it, just not anybody. In other words, sorry for somebody else's, I mean, your kid to do it, but not for somebody else's kid to do it. You're living in a day and time, ladies and gentlemen, where if you don't understand what he says here in Proverbs chapter number 1, he said, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. You say, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to give you some instruction. I'm trying to tell you that I'm giving you a fail-safe plan that if you prepare yourself right now for eternity, you'll never regret it. And I'm not talking about just being saved. You better get your eyes off of worrying about what's going to happen with the nation and what's going to worry about with politics and what's going to happen. You better get your eyes off all that. You better get your eyes on what's going to happen with the Lord. The church, if the Bible's right, there comes a falling away first. That means the people in church... Galatians 5, he said, who did hinder you from following him? Somebody got in the way. What do I have to be cautious about? Something interrupting between me and the Lord. And you know what it can be? It can be skin for skin, all that a man hath he gives for his life. What centers me? I'll just tell you what works for me. It may not work for you. But I realize when I get that way and I get kind of apathetic about coming to church and reading my Bible and praying and I sort of lose purpose and, and those kind of things, it's go back to the old-fashioned, I'm scared, S-K-E-E-R-E-D of the Lord. I want to do what's right and I don't want to break His fellowship. And in order for Him to give me things, Isaiah 66, in order for the secrets that He has, for Him to reveal those things to me, the number one thing I have to do, the prerequisite is I have to fear Him. And if you don't fear Him, He's not going to tell you what's happening. If there was ever a time that you need to know what's happening, listen, don't you like to know if a hurricane's coming? I mean, they're not going to tell you they're spinning up off the coast and start watching them now. That'll come later on. But don't you, don't you think about it now. Don't you want to know about it coming? Why? So you can make preparations. Well, I'm telling you there's a hurricane coming. I'm telling you the time is short and I'm telling you that the time is coming where you're going to be mocked and belittled and made fun of because you're old-timey, old-fashioned, King James-only Bible-believing Christians. And as a result, you know what they're going to do? They're going to ostracize you. They're going to put you better prepare yourself for it. Steal yourself again. And get a backbone. Some of the very ones listening here that are here on a Sunday night and come on Wednesday night, you'll be the ones that will wind up falling away. You say, why? They put that pressure on you and they put that pressure on your kids and it comes from your family and it comes from your friends and it comes from your finances. It's already happening. And you don't want to be affiliated or associated because it creates a rub. It creates controversy. And then the next thing you know, the things you say you believe and the things you're locked in on, then before long, you know what you think? You've forgotten all about the terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And before long, you start working it out in your mind and well, a little bit won't hurt. And I'm not talking about, see, you're not the kind of people that do inordinate affections and terrible things like that. That's not how you are. The stuff that we do, that kind of stuff doesn't get you folks out. But you still get sideways with people. And you still get lazy in your spiritual life. And it's not real to you like it used to be. And when's the last time you told somebody that they were going to hell? I mean, you can do that in a nice way. When's the last time that you just told somebody you cared about them so much with a tear running down your cheek that you just said, listen man, I don't want to see you burn. You say, why? You know that time's coming. Or at least you used to. Look, if you will, there in the book of Proverbs again. Uh, pick it up, if you will, in verse number 29. Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 29. Um, they shall call upon me, verse 28, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated the knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. You know, one of the reasons that I wind up not getting uh, uh, my answers, oftentimes, it's right there. Hated knowledge. What knowledge? When he's trying to tell me what's right and what to do right for me. You ever been to the doctor before? Anybody ever been to the doctor before? You been to their doctor? Anybody? You ever go to the doctor and the doctor tell you you got the epizoulus? Or whatever it might be? 
And when you sit down there with the doctor, the doctor says, now listen, we have a medicine that can cure this, and if you'll take this medicine, and you know, two pills a day or one pill a day or whatever it might be, and uh, you go home and go, that doctor's crazy, I'm not going to do what he says, and he's instructed you on every reason why you have it and what you need to do to get well, and then you wind up not getting well and you to make fun of the doctor. The problem's not the doctor. The problem is you don't feel fear the repercussions of the results of not doing what the doctor said and you hate the knowledge that he gave you that said, you're sick. Something's wrong with you. But we hate it when it's that way. Well, I might be sick, but I'm not as sick as she is. I'm not as sick as he is. I'm not as sick as they are. I mean, I'm not a Catholic or a Charismatic, and I'm not a Church of Christ, and I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I mean, I might be sick, but I'm not going to... Hey, hated knowledge and refuse to fear Him, you say, why? The Lord's not judging you based on what everybody else does. The Lord's judging you based upon you and His relationship. And the Bible said, one, they hated knowledge, and two, they didn't fear Me. They weren't afraid to not do what I told them to do. I don't want to get better. You know why you uh, wind up dying once you get sick? Because you don't get well. You say, well, how do I get well? Well, I think that's why the Lord gave you doctors. I'm prejudicial toward that. I believe that there's a lot of things that doctors may say to you, a lot of things doctors may want you to do. You have to have some sense about those kinds of things. But the, one of the things that you might do is stop reading so much WebMD and do what the doctor tells you to do. He wants what, what's, it good to, what's it going to do for him and his reputation if you do what he tells you to do and it doesn't work out? And well, He won't be in uh, practicing very long. He'll be considered a quack. If he treats everybody for a cold and says, here's two aspirin, call me in the morning, I mean, his uh, cure rate won't be 50%. It won't be long. Nobody's going to come see him. But you don't think about that stuff. When it comes to the Bible, sometimes the reason the Lord cuts you off is, is because you hate the knowledge. The knowledge you hate is not about world events. The knowledge you and I tend to hate is knowledge about mine and your personal life and about our downsitting and our uprising and our failures and our relationship with the Lord. That's the knowledge that we don't like. Boy, we like the attention when it's Him patting us on the back and telling us we did good. But when He has those little private come to Jesus meeting and said, you're arrogant, you're proud, you got a problem with your attitude, you have a problem with authority, you have a problem, you know what you do? You'll walk out. Who are you to talk to me like that? The Lord said, you hated knowledge, and if you feared me, you wouldn't go on, get on the internet, get on Instagram, Snapchat, and talk about somebody that parked in your parking place. But we hate that knowledge, don't we? Okay, well, I hate that knowledge. You're like, well, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't mind being up front with the Lord. They used to make a big deal about uh, uh, Schlesinger. She's a Jewish lady, a psychiatrist, and they talked about Dr. Laura and how she talked straight all the time and all that kind of a deal. That lady made millions of dollars off of people that called in there, and then they hung up the phone, and then she gave out this advice and stuff like that without any worry about repercussions, and they all said, boy, she's really good talking straight. I wonder if she talked straight like that to you if you'd take it. You didn't mind taking it indirectly from somebody else. Oh boy, she really told them, man. <laughs> oh, what if the Lord told you that? What if the Lord said you're the problem? I love truth, don't you? You'd be a fool not to love truth. But how about when the truth comes out about you and it's not a very pleasant thing? If you fear the Lord, you know what you'll do? You'll take that advice and take it under wing. Look in Psalms chapter number 34. Psalms 34. I'm not upset with you, and I'm not, I'm not angered, but childishness is one of those... Uh, it, it comes from an individual who hates knowledge. They're never the problem. They're always justified in their actions. I was talking to a dear friend of mine the other day, and he said, you know, preacher, sometimes people say this and say that and so on and so forth, and what I do is I read that passage where you were this morning, and I see where Jesus Christ has the religious Pharisees and the people coming at Him and poking Him and prodding Him, and when reviled, He reviled not again, and He answered not a word. Well, that's a good way to be. But that takes a walk with the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to do that. Because our natural propensity, our tendency is, is we want to defend ourselves, yeah. defend our actions. Yeah. Everybody in here thinks they're right most of the time. Amen. And none of us is right when it comes to when we sit down with the Lord. Right. Right. Amen. 
the thing about the Lord is, is He doesn't sit down like, a, like in management classes they give you and they say you get ready to give an end of the month evaluation or six month evaluation or one year evaluation, get your step raises, whatever it might be. And they always teach you this. You've been to any management class, I don't care what it is and what company you work for. It's always you're supposed to set them up and say, well, you did this good and 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 boy, you sure did this good and you did this good and you did this good. And after you've had about three evaluations, you realize, what's coming. The other shoe's fixing to drop. You did all this good, but okay, get to the bottom line. Am I going to get the raise or not? Well, you know, you did all these things good, but you messed up here and you messed up here and you messed up here. And then they give you a, an employee performance improvement plan. You say, why? It's incumbent upon them to try to make you a better employee, so they give you an improvement plan. You know what they dangle over that? They dangle over that your step raise. Yeah. You want your step raised, then get in line. Right? Well, how about when the Lord comes along to you, you expect Him every time to say, you did good today, you got up. You did good today, you're breathing my air. You did good today, you're seeing with my eyeballs. You did good today, you're hearing with my ears. You did good today, you're speaking with my mouth and using my lips. See, you did, you did good today, you made it to work. You did good today, how about I have somewhat against thee? How about when he comes across that way? You know what? The weird, it doesn't bother us anymore. There's no fear, like he says. No fear of God before their eyes, Romans 3. The reason we keep doing what we're doing is there's no fear. If you honestly feared God, ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't do half the things you do that are hurtful to the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the body of Christ. And some of you wouldn't be miserable. Some of you, you cannot enjoy Jesus Christ as long as somebody else is having a better time than you are. Your whole life is wrapped up in other people and what they are or are not doing. You don't have your own relationship with the Lord. Your relationship hinges on whether or not somebody else is or isn't happy with you and whether or not they're patting you or not patting you. And unless you get that affirmation, you know what you do? You can't enjoy Jesus. Right. You don't have a personal relationship. And the Lord says, see, I got somewhat against you. Lord, just tell me all the good things I did. Okay. Performance review time. You want the raise at the judgment seat? Lord, get down to brass tacks. Tell me where I messed up and let me fix it. He comes over there for a while there. He's walking out of the vineyard. I'm coming to this here in a second in Psalm 34. I didn't forget where I'm at. And he walks through that uh, vineyard there and he comes out there and there's a fig tree. And he looks at that fig tree and he said, I'll be jumping. Boy, I've been looking at that fig tree now for nearly three years. And every time I come out the gate, that fig tree is over there. And you know all it's doing is, is it's sucking up all the minerals and all the good stuff uh, from all these other trees and everything. I mean, they'd be better trees because it's sucking up all the same thing they're sucking up, but it ain't bearing no fruit. I'm paraphrasing. And you know what he says to the guy that's running or tending the vineyard? He says to him, uh, to the, to the uh, gardener that's taking care of that, you know what he says? He said, cut it down. You say, why? It cumbereth the ground. It's soaking up all the minerals and all the things that are here and it's for the purpose of bearing fruit. But all it's doing is bearing leaves and it looks real pretty, but it doesn't ever bear any fruit. Cut it down. And the man that's in charge of tending it, he said, uh, boss man, I'll tell you what, if you give me a chance here, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to dig it out there, I'd like to aerate it some, and I'd like to dung it. I'd like to take some cow manure and some chicken manure and some rabbit poop and things like that, and I'd like to put that around that and try to get those little risins that are out there, the little uh, hair roots that run through there. I'd like to try to get them on the surface where they can get some air to them and get some water to them and get some sunlight to them and create some photosynthesis. And I realize it's a nice tree and all that, and but it's not bearing fruit. But could you give me another chance with it? But you know what would happen if that was a Christian? You wouldn't appreciate the digging and you wouldn't appreciate the dunging. You say, why? When you get ready to dig a tree like that, they don't just scratch the ground. They go in deep. You know what they do a lot of times when they're trying to preserve a tree like that, especially one that gets root bound, they come in there with a spade and they cut those roots. They amputate the, the hair roots and the things running off into the distance, and especially those running on the top of the ground. They cut those things. You don't think that's painful? And then they dig around that thing. And you know what happens? A lot of times the Lord comes into our life and He says, we need to dig a little deeper. The reason some of you are where you are the Christian life and you stayed where you are and you're stalemated is because you don't want the Lord digging around in your soil. 
and you don't like the stench of what he puts on you. Can I just say that? Dung, you don't have to have the modern version of that word. You know what that is. Do you know what dung smells like? I mean, if you've ever raked out a, a barn, you've ever raked out or raked behind cows or anything like that, or been through the field, I mean, you go through there and pile all that stuff out. And you know what you do? You take it out there. If you don't have vegetables and stuff, you throw it all out in the pasture and you scatter it. You say, why? It nourishes the ground. But boy, you get downwind from that stuff. I don't care who you are. And there is no way you don't get it on you. And you know what you can tell? When somebody knows that you have been working with that stuff, they can tell what you've been doing all day long. Anybody ever use chicken fertilizer at all? All you have to do is be around that dust. You ever use, uh, to, you ever use tobacco? You ever use to, to, tobacco to kill? Uh, I'm not talking about use tobacco, smoke it or chew it. Uh, you ever use tobacco to, to kill uh, 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 bugs and things like that? Or you go out there and you spread that stuff around as just a real fine powder like they used to have at the King Edward Cigar Factory. You take that stuff out there, uh, it ain't snuff, man. I mean, it's, it's like a talcum powder. That stuff gets in your nose and gets in your ears and gets in your eyes and you, just, you smell like a tobacco plant when you're done. Well, you know what I know about Christians? I know about Christians that it'd be better for us if we'd be willing to take the digging and the dunging, but we don't fear God enough to let Him dig it. He knows how to dig it. You just don't, you're afraid of what he might find out. Why are you telling me this, preacher? Because if you get it right now, you don't have to worry about facing it at the judgment seat. Why not fix it now? Why get mad at a preacher? Why is it that right now, at this moment right now, that you are in a situation right now that you're constantly thinking about someone else instead of you and your situation with the Lord? You're not seeing yourself at the judgment seat. You're thinking about somebody that licked the chocolate off your peanuts. A boyfriend that jilted you. A bad marriage. A business partner that did you wrong. Things that, you did, that didn't go the way you think they ought to go. You know what you think is, is you think that if I just had those things go right in my life, well, why didn't they? Let's pause for just a moment. Why didn't they go right? You think God had anything to do with that at all? I mean, if you really fear the Lord, you know what you're going to know? You're going to know that God's going to have His will done whether you're in subjection to it or not. And what you have to learn to do is, is not pray for you to be able to say, now Lord, I want you to have your will. You pray, Lord, help me to accept your will for my life. Amen. Suppose the Lord says to you, no. Well, Lord, if I can't do it there, I'll do it somewhere else. And the Lord said, oh, okay. You're special. I remember a preacher one time, he was preaching a meeting, he got a little carried away, and everybody does, and I've done it before, people do it, it's sort of, uh, one of those regular things, and he got up there and he's preaching about the fear of God and being afraid of God and this and that and the other, and you're more afraid of men than you're afraid of God, and he made this statement, and it's a really stupid statement, and I'm going to tell you the statement. He said, listen, if God shuts a door, he said, just take your number 12 and plant it right in the middle of that door and kick that door plumb off the hinges. Man, I almost got up and walked out. I thought, God shut the door and you kicked the door off the hinges? Now what he's trying to say is, is be bold and just go ahead and do it. Man, you're going to get somebody killed. That's the epitome of stupidity. To tell a young preacher, God closes the door, just kick the door off the hinges and go on in there anyway. You're a fool to do that. You say, what is that? You think you know more than God. You're just determined, I'm going to do it. God, I'm jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. You catch me. Some of you are bitter at God because you jumped and He let you go kaplooey. You had all these plans of how it was going to work out and God said to you, that's not my plan for you. You never consulted me at all. You just assumed that's how it's going to be. And the Lord said, can I change your plans? You ever think about Genesis chapter number 22? I'm coming to this in a second. In Genesis 22, you think that was an Abram's plan? Abraham's going to go up there and offer his son, his only son Isaac, up there in a land called Moriah, and going up there knowing he's going to wind up killing his son. You think that was in his plan? 
God comes along with the Apostle Paul and he's riding high, man, and knocking them low. And all of a sudden the Lord knocks him off there into the dirt there and he sees the resurrected Lord there, a light far and above the sun, blinds him that time. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick. You think that's in Paul's plan? You think Paul's plan was a day and a night in the deep and in hungerings and fastings often and being in jail and being out of jail and being naked and being in prison and being in peril and all. You think that's in Paul's plan? No, the difference is the Apostle Paul said, I no longer have a plan. Every day I wake up and say, what do I do today, sir? You say, what is that? That's real Christianity. Taking your hands off the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. Yeah, I'll be over here in the back seat somewhere, Lord. You drive the car. You help me to accept your will for my life. And that goes across the board. And I know what I'm saying. But God doesn't make mistakes. And when God said, this is what I'm going to do, you know what you pray? Lord, help me to accept your will. You know what you're doing. I don't. I'm not a bulwark of faith, Lord. I'm just as scared as anybody else is scared. But I know that you know i got to get in line with you, not you get in line with me. Amen. That's not how God works. This idea, this thought that God owes me an explanation. What foolishness is that? You know what Job tried to pull that stunt? And Job 38, he says to Job says, when I see the Lord, I'm going to ask him this and ask him this and ask him this, as if the Lord couldn't hear him. And Job said to him, I mean, the Lord said to him, Hey, Job, I'm listening, but before I answer your question, I want to know where were you when I formed the earth, and where were you when I hung the earth on nothing, and where were you when I set the foundations, and where were you when the morning sun... If you can answer that, Job, I'll answer you. Otherwise, you better shut your mouth, boy. You better remember who you're talking to. I thank God I have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I thank God that I can go talk to Him. But i got to remember who it is I'm talking to. I don't command Him. It's not my will, but Thine be done. Lord, help me to get my will in line with Your will. Well, I'm choosing to do this. Okay, Lord. And mean it. Well, I'm taking the pulpit. Okay. Why would you want to stay where he doesn't want you? You know what he said to Zeke? I've been reading it. He said, uh, about this time tomorrow morning, I'm going to take your wife and don't shed a tear. That's pretty real right now. Yeah. Well, Lord, why in the cat hair would you do that? He never explained. He said, I'm taking her. Don't cry. Jeremiah? You never got the pleasure of having a wife. Would God make a mistake? See, you get the idea, well, you know, God, God just shouldn't do things like that. I just don't believe that, that the Lord ought to do stuff like that. Who in the cat hair do you think you are? We've gotten way too familiar with a holy God. We've gotten way too close to the cotton where we kind of nuzzle up next to Him and we kind of think that we have a right to have explanation for whatever it is He chooses to do. If He blesses it, He does. And if He doesn't, He doesn't. That ought to scare you. It ought to be a blessing to you if you get a prayer through. Okay, Lord, well, thank you. I appreciate you doing that. You didn't have to do that, but I sure appreciate you doing it. And let it go. But he didn't have to answer your prayer. Sometimes you get mad at him, don't you, when he doesn't answer the prayer you think he ought to answer? Take your Bible, if you will. Are you in Psalm 34 yet? I've given you long enough to get there. <laughs> Look in verse number 7. Psalm 34, verse number 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them. That what? That what? Now, I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to, uh, to be in camp around me. Do you? You know what he said? I encamp around them that fear him. And then go on and look at the rest of the verse. Your deliverance comes, but it comes only if you fear him. Look, if you will, in Psalms 103. Psalms 103. He 
He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Thank God. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that... That seems opposite, doesn't it? He said, if I fear Him, He'll give me the mercy. That means the antithesis seems to be that if, in fact, that I uh, don't fear Him, then I don't get the mercy that I need from Him. Not justice, mercy. Psalms 111. Look at verse number 10. A couple more after this and we'll let you take a break. Maybe some of you can help us clean up a little bit. Psalms 111, look at verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord, 112. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and delighteth greatly in His commandments. Do you like greatly in His commandments? I don't know if you do. Is it alright for God to do with you what He wants to do with you? I mean, do you see yourself in Luke 17? Can I just get down to brass tacks with you? Can I say that we're all employed by the Lord to a certain degree and any of us having the privilege of working in His field in the first place should be quite privileged and we should think of ourselves as being a privilege to be able to serve Him? And how many of you see yourself as when you come in that you go about taking care of the Master before yourself and after you've done that which is your duty to do, you declare yourself an unprofitable servant? That's Luke 17. Do you see yourself that way? Well, those that fear Him do. It's the Lord's business anyway. It's not a political hierarchy of trying to see who can outdo who and who gets credit for what. He's keeping account. It doesn't matter who recognizes you down here for whatever you do. I don't care who thinks how many people follow you on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat and how many people think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. None of that matters. He's not having a popular opinion. He's not running polls in heaven right now to see how you're trending in the polls. No trending when you get up there in heaven. What a ridiculous idea. That's something only a man can come by. Because you're popular with the people, then that winds up making you successful as a Christian. Are you popular with Him? I know a lot of people that are popular. I mean, we had a big mob of people here today. But I know people that have four and five times that. We were driving home the other day, and this guy comes on the radio. Oh, we'd love to invite you to your to our, uh, he called it some service. He didn't call it Resurrection or Easter, but some kind of service for the special day or something. And he said, I'd love to have you come, and if you feel like you have to be here for this worship experience, uh, make sure you go ahead and plan on coming. Uh, But I want to say this to you, it might be better so that other people can come that you stay home. We don't have any room for all the people anymore. Oh, to have that problem... He said, we have no overflow rooms and we have nowhere else to put people and it's standing room only and it has been for a long time, especially at this special time of the year and so on and so forth. A charismatic outfit. Well, he's popular. I mean, if you look at that, you know what you think? Well, he's popular. He's got all those people. He must really be doing something for the Lord. Are you sure? You think Osteen, who has about 30,000 in attendance and has over a million people watching every week and writes books all over, you think because of popularity when he gets to eternity that that means he's going to amount to something? Just because men give you credit for things, that doesn't mean anything in his accounting. Amen. Well, we've lost our fear of him. Our fear, not reverential trust, like scared, trembling. You used to preach the Bible and you just say, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith... These boys get up here and they say, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And you are... I mean, if that's God's words, shouldn't there be some fear? Take your Bible and come a little bit further here. Come to Isaiah chapter number 50. Isaiah 50, two more. I've been remiss at not hammering this hard enough. I don't think that there is a more important message for this time. If the devils believe and tremble at the Lord, and they're in hell and going to hell... What does that say about us? 
Don't you find that a little odd? This is intended to help us get our attention, maybe to put some spiritual smelling salts in our nose and help us to get back to the basics of realizing, hey, I need to check my relationship with the Lord. Not my wife, my husband, my kids, my... All, no, my relationship with the Lord. Do I fear the Lord like I used to fear the Lord? Am I worried about what He thinks about me? Preacher, that just, that just sounds a little uh, scary. That sounds a little like bondage and, and that sounds a little bit... That's spoken by somebody that doesn't not afraid of him. I'm afraid of what he thinks about me. I'm honing in on the terror of the Lord. I'm not quite ready to lay it all out yet, but boy, I'm getting it. You say, how'd you come about it? Praying over this thing about the fear of the Lord. And I see the importance all through the Bible, and I'm starting to realize, uh uh-huh. That's why Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. If you know the terror of the Lord, you're going to see it up there if you don't fear it down here. Isaiah chapter number 50, quickly verse number 10. Who among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of His servant, that walketh in darkness, hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon God. You know what he said? He said, you're not in darkness and you don't have light if you fear the Lord. You're sure about what you're doing, where you're going, what you're supposed to do. Whether somebody else thinks you are or not. Are you doing what God would have you to do? Jeremiah chapter 26, and we're going to close here tonight. Jeremiah 26. I feel like even though I'm preaching this stuff to you, I I feel like I'm doing it a disservice. I I, I don't feel like I'm scary enough. I don't feel like I'm hard enough. I don't feel like I'm rough enough. I don't feel like I'm, I don't feel like I'm driving the point home enough. I don't, I don't feel like I'm, I, I'm capable of helping you understand the importance of this. If the Lord says it to you one time, we should pay attention. Agreed? I've given you already in the process of these last three weeks that we've been studying the fear of the Lord, I've given you over 50 references. And some of you are still... When's he going to talk about Revelation? And we need to study Daniel. What's that beast that got all them funny things on it? You know, if the devil really feared God, he'd change. You know what the devil's problem is? He doesn't fear God or you. Even though the devil knows he lost the battle at Calvary. And when he couldn't persuade the Lord to not die up there while the Lord is dying on the cross and the devil's right in his face and all the hell is turned out against him and all the mankind's against him and all the, the religious people are against him and all that stuff's going on and when the devil can't turn him, he puts him down there and three days later he comes back up even though the devil knows that he lost that battle, why doesn't the devil repent? You ever wondered? I can tell you why. There's no fear in him. He's not afraid of it. He's not afraid of you. If the devil were to show up right now, you say, what would you do? I'd run and hide behind the Lord. You say, why? The Lord may give him permission to kill me. So wouldn't you go toe-to-toe to the devil? No, I'm not that stupid. But some of you are more afraid of the devil than you are afraid of God. Why is that? Do you think maybe is it possible that the sleep of Laodicea has crept into us? Do you think maybe that even that we as Bible-believing, independent, King James only, rightly dividing, street preaching, and hell-hating, heaven-loving Christians, do you think maybe that, 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 that slumber of Laodicea has, has sort of slipped in on us? And it's kind of like, well, yeah, I know, but it's not really the God I need right now. When did you think He ever let up off the gas? Now what's beginning to happen is the generations that are coming up, it's even worse. Because the parents and the grandparents have taught them, that's ah, just God. It's not really that big a deal. You've got to have a balance. You've got to be chilled out. Don't get too carried away. Everybody's got to have a little fun. Okay. Just turn that fear down. You know what will happen? That kid will be in the back seat of a car one day. It's never happened. It happened to some of you. You're just sitting here and nobody knows about it. 
You know why you made that fatal mistake you made? You say, well, I got overwhelmed. No, you lost your fear of God. And that's why we've all done things we had no business doing. Can I get a witness? Amen. That's the truth. If I feared God, I bet I wouldn't do it. If I feared God, I bet I'd bite my tongue. If I feared God, I, I dare say I stay out of a lot more trouble. Live a cleaner life. I find for me personally, if I fear the Lord, I don't have to have a set of rules. My dad never gave me a set of rules. <laughs> I just knew my daddy wouldn't want me doing it. He said, well, I was afraid to get my uh, posterior tore up. I just, that's just not a good thing. I don't know. It got me out of a lot of trouble. Not all trouble, but a lot of it. Jeremiah, if you will please, and we'll finish up here if I can ever get around to it. Chapter 26, verse number 19. That Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death. Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord? And the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them. Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. You know what he said there? He said, you know what? Because of his fear of the Lord, he decided that he wouldn't do what he was planning on doing because he was afraid. I like Job in the Bible, but I also like Jonah, believe it or not. Jonah's one of those individuals that's in the, in the Bible that when you study him or you take a, you take a look at him, uh, Jonah comes in there and he, uh, he talks back to the Lord. But what I like is, is he goes in there and he preaches and those people believe what he preaches and that king over there in Nineveh is so afraid of what God's going to do. You know what he does? He makes sure God knows he's afraid. You say, how? He repents in sackcloth and ashes and he claims a fast, not just for him, but even for the animals. You say, now why did he do that? Now I'm going to tell you why. It's not because it did the animals any good at all. He was so afraid of the judgment of God that the first thing he did was he said, hey, Lord, I'm going to let you know even the animals are going to fast. And I'm going to put the animals in sackcloth. I mean business. I'm afraid. I believe what you're telling me. Yet there's so many days and the Lord's going to burn this city. I believe you. I'm afraid of you. You ever been that afraid of the Lord? Preacher, that's not, I don't know that that really draws you. It doesn't? Why wouldn't you want to be close to somebody like that? Would you just give it some consideration? Would you consider that in Laodicea, you get to play in too many games? You joke around a little too much about spiritual things? You don't lock in on the things that are really, really important in life. Life before long takes that edge off and you get accustomed to it. You know what happens when you lose that fear? I found this, and a friend of mine just sent me a message about this the other day. He said, I've learned in battle. He's a big-time soldier and was in war and all kind of other things. And he said, you know, the strange thing is, he said, they learned how to overcome fear in battle. And I said, how did they do that? And he said, you can't have fear and pride in the same body. And he said, if they can make you proud, they can take away your fear. And I thought, he said, you can't be afraid of something you're proud of. That's profound. And I was like, well, that's the devil. Only by pride. So you know what I realized? He's right. And we've lost our fear. You say, why? We're proud. Therefore, we can't be any longer afraid. We've accomplished so much. We're so special. And then before long, that fear doesn't bother us like it used to bother us. We become proud. <coughs> pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit. Uh, pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Just something to think about. How come you're not afraid? I don't know. Are you proud? Why would you go contrary to what's clearly written in the Word of God? I don't know, are you proud? Are you so proud that you think you can rightly divide your way out of that Bible? Mm 
It doesn't apply to you? I don't know, maybe. Heavenly Father, I pray you might help us with these matters. And we sure do thank you, Lord. For